Uh, before I get going with the message, uh, let's bow our heads one more time for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for this wonderful, wonderful day that you've given us. Um, we thank you for the ability to still have the freedom to gather together in your name. We know that during the end times, this freedom to worship you is not going to always be there. But in the meantime, that we still have that, we thank you for this opportunity to be here for this sanctuary, this building that has been dedicated to your honor to worship you. And I implore that the Holy Spirit be here, especially be with me, as I try to communicate your word, your message that you have for all of us today. I ask this not because of anything that I've earned, we've earned, but I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, amen. All right. Um, so this is uh, something very, uh, an image that you may have seen quite frequently in social media, right? God equals love, right? And love is, is an emotion, right? It's something that uh, we hear, uh, we may have felt, but for some of you who've been here uh, before, probably heard uh, a sermon where I, where I talk about specifically of emotions. And this may be a little bit uh, of, of a quiz that you already had. And you're just like, hey, I took that test before and, and I passed. And that's okay. But there's new people here and, and it's not going to be children's quiz or teenagers quiz. It's just going to be a church quiz, I guess. So uh, no need for microphones today. Just say it out loud uh, because... We're going to see some faces here. What, what emotion is that? What expression is surprise, right? It's, it, we don't have to hear anything. We just have to read, observe. A teenager is like, you know, I've seen that face, right? What, what's this face? <laughs> Anger, right? The nose is a primary indicator when somebody uh, is angry, right? Then we have this one. Yes, fear, scared. It's it, now we get a little bit too like, wait, wasn't the first one similar to this one? And yes, you'd be surprised that uh, uh, surprise and fear have quite similar biological changes, right? Maybe some uh, uh, of our praise team members, I know I feel it when I have to play or when I have to uh, present in front and preach. My hands get a little sweaty. My heart starts to beat a little faster, right? But scared and excited share a lot of similarities, and, th and that emotion can be easily switched one way or the other. Now, this one, you know, that nose is not really anger, so I'll give you a cue. A cue. It's not anger. It's a different type of emotion that it's quite natural, but sometimes we don't want to tell the other person, or if we have this reaction, uh, we don't want to really admit that this is how we feel. What, what, what emotion is this? Can I, hear, can I hear some suggestions? Disgust. Contempt. Disgust, right? We're like, ah, that food that I see at Potluck, right? Oh, no, no, never happens. Never happens, right? No, not at Scott's of Thunderbird. Not at Scott's of Thunderbird, right? But maybe when somebody said something, when you saw a specific behavior, you have this reaction, and it's involuntarily, it's a reflex. It is not something you think about. Emotions are different than our thoughts. These happens. They're important. They're good signals to tell us something has changed internally or something has changed externally. And this is contempt. That change in the mouth, it's specific with the eyes, tells us, that we see that as beneath us. We see that as something not at our level. So disgust and contempt are natural emotions that we experience. And that is telling us something about, again, externally happening near us or internally happening with us. And finally, that change in the mouth, that change in the eyes, what is this young gentleman expressing or feeling? happiness, right? All of this just through facial expressions, right? Now, 
We have plenty more, like I mentioned, research. We do a lot of research on this area, right, on this topic. And there are many, many more emotions. There's plenty of theories that I could go for hours, but Pastor will probably be back, and I'll still be here talking about uh, emotions, right? So there are a lot of emotions that we experience, feelings, sensations, right? But one of them is love. And that's why today's sermon is through loving God. We know that Jesus, uh, when he was questioned uh, by the, the Pharisees, right, he gave this answer. that They asked him, right, they were trying to trip him. They were trying to cast doubt in the authority that he was speaking with, right? And he, he was asked, right, what is the greatest commandment? At that time, with all the uh, rabbinic laws, it had expanded from the Ten Commandments into hundreds, hundreds of rabbinic laws, right? But Jesus answered quite succinctly, the number one commandment, the greatest commandment is love God and then love your neighbor. This is what Jesus was quoting, right? It's not necessarily Exodus in the Ten Commandments that he was quoting, right? But something that Moses uh, said, right? And it's, it's so, co what a coincidence that the pastor was mentioning and showing us uh, Moab right in the background, right? So before Moses died, he gave kind of like a last farewell speech, right? And Deuteronomy is kind of those three last sections of where Moses is addressing um, uh, the people of Israel, right? And here we see in Deuteronomy 6, uh, starting in verse 4, it goes all the way through verse 8. This is what is typically known as the Shema. But the first part starts like this. Hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. So here's something very interesting, right? The first part of here Israel, right? As we've translated uh, this phrase from Hebrew to Latin to Greek to a couple of different translations and eventually coming to English, right? Uh, the best way that people found to translate it is here. Because then we have to expand a little bit more, which you can do in a sermon, right? Of what does it actually mean, right? This Hebrew word is talking about more pay attention because here are some instructions that you need to take action with, right? So we have to condense all of that, uh, that, that Hebrew word into just here, right? And, and it's still fairly accurate, right? But there's no English word that could encompass all of those components, which is pay attention, instructions are coming that you need to follow and take action, right? And we see this, right, effectively, right? In Matthew, one of the areas, you know, you see it in the uh, Synoptic Gospels, Mark and Luke also have it, right? And Jesus replied that first part, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is, which that image uh, showed earlier, love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, right? So it's very interesting, right? Love. Love God. God, since the beginning, has loved all of his creation, created his, in his image. He gave humanity the garden of even, right? We see a lot of evidence of God loving us. But a relationship, right? Emotions help connection. Emotions help in our human interactions, right? And this is where this component of it cannot just be from one side. It also requires us as his creation, as human beings, to take action. One of the ways in which God loves us is by giving us the freedom to choose what we do. And this is why he's reminding us, I love you. Hear me. Love God. Love me. This is very crucial, right? And we're going to get into a little bit of why this is so important, right? But before getting into it, the other components um, that the Shema was mentioning there and that we also see uh, in Matthew, uh, Jesus was uh, answering this question, right? 
is that he is telling us how to love. He's not just saying, love God. This is how you love God. And in the Shema, in Hebrew, this, these are the words that you will see uh, if you, you studied uh, in Hebrew, right? Lebab is the first word, right? And oftentimes, this is where we will talk about logic, right? Our reasoning. I don't know how many of you identify with this, with this picture here, right? You know what to do, but what you feel is an opposite direction of what you know to do. Your emotions are telling you something. Your knowledge tells you something else. I see it frequently in what I have to do, right? We call this dissonance, right? This is something where what we know, our values, what we've been told to do is an opposite to the way that we feel. And this is why God is telling us, you know, it can't just be emotion. It cannot just be also just knowledge. It has to be nefesh, which is soul. It also has the same root of when God gave the breath of life. Right? So something about life uh, and, and our emotions and what we feel come from that component of the, 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 the living breath that we have from God. So it's what you feel, it's what you think, fully committed. The word meldecha, is, 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 this is component of strength. Like you're going to use all your power to bring how you think and how you feel to love God. Right? It's not just like, yeah, I kind of like God. He's all right, right? He's cool. He's cool. It's like, but just on Saturday, right? And I'm going to check what it, when is sundown. Okay, after that, you know, that's it. That's all my commitment. It's just from Saturday sundown to Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. And then I have other responsibilities, God. I'll see you next Saturday, right? No, he's asking us. Fully commit every single day, right? If you continue reading Deuteronomy, he says, and you shall teach this to your children every morning and every night, right? That devotional aspect uh, in Jewish home to this day, they have this uh, verse in every post because part of it says in every door and every post and every time somebody enters a new building, they touch it and they kiss it. It is not just a commitment when it's convenient for us, or when it's the Sabbath. This is what Meodech is. It's with everything, all your strength, use your mind, use your emotions to love God. Okay? Fully. To love. To love. What are the things that you love? As you can tell, I'm, 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 I'm always interested in, 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 the, in, in the meaning of words, right? Part of it, because I actually had to learn a couple of languages, and I got into a lot of trouble speaking Spanish in different places, because the same word had a different meaning. I still get in trouble with my wife sometimes. She's from Argentina. What can I say? They, they have it wrong. Just joking. Love you. Love you. Love you, mi amor. One of the, one of the words with meaning that consistently gives us uh, issues, right, is the word now, right? In Mexico, we say ahorita, which is sometime, indefinitely in the future. But if you actually look at it, it means like right now in many other countries. So she asked something for me, you know, do the dishes, take the trash, right? So like, ahorita. 30 seconds later, she looks at it and it's like, it's still there, right? The meaning of the words is are important. Here in our culture, in the U.S., in our modern culture, we hear, or at least I hear the word love used frequently for a lot of things. I love the 49ers. I've said that. Pastor says he's loved the Seahawks, right? You know, what's that type of emotion we have with our sports teams, right? I love this food, right? I love going to church, going to school. Do kids say they love going to school? Some of them still do, right? Some don't. We use the word love to describe many things that do not 
accurately reflect the biblical concept, the biblical tr truth of love. These other meanings of, or situations where we might be using the word love have to do with things we like, things we prefer. Nothing wrong with that. I can like a sports team. I can prefer this food compared to the other, right? It could also mean I like and enjoy the feeling of pleasure, of satisfaction, of fun, of enjoyment. All of those things can be very valid, but they're not love. They mean something differently. And the reason that I'm bringing attention to this is because the enemy is the master of deception. And he can utilize all of these different experiences to confuse us about love, which is essential to our understanding of who God is, right? And going back to the Bible, right, the Old Testament and Aramaic and Hebrew, right, the word to love, which you will find in Deuteronomy 6, 4 right there that we just read, is ahab, right? Vehabte. It's, it's compounded to hear your love, love your God. And then in Matthew, and this is where, you know, Mark is, is, is doing a wonderful job preparing for our Friday agape feast, right? In Greek, the word to love is agape. And this is where the Bible really tells us that love transcends what an emotion is. It's that emotion, it's that thought, it's that full commitment, and it has specific qualities. Now, this also should be uh, relatively uh, well-known. First Corinthians, right? Let's go through all of it. Well, not all of it. Let's just do the first half here, right? Uh, where we, we see Paul describing to the church in Cor Corinth, right, what love is, right? Again, maybe some of them were uh, native Greek speakers, right? And they were reading the, the Shema, and it's like, I'm having difficulty translating this Hebrew. Can you, can you help us, Paul, right? So he writes in Greek, right, uh, what love is, right? And he first tells us, right, this is what is not. This is, this, these are things that are great qualities, perhaps. These are very important things, but these are not love, right? So he starts um, in uh, chapter 13 saying, If I speak with the tongues of mankind and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all of the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, right? That's a lot of faith. But do not have love, what do I have? Nothing. And if I give away all my possessions to charity, and if I surrender my body so that I may glorify you, but do not have love, it does me no good. Financial wealth, knowledge, skills, abilities, all great things, right? Jesus talked about the talents uh, that he is giving all of us. But those things are not love. What is love, right? The second part, and I'm using the New Living Translation uh, that has a little bit more uh, modern language uh, when it describes what love is, right? What is love? It's patient. It's kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. No, love never loses fate. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So here Paul is clarifying what agape means. Oahab, right, in Hebrew, right? He's telling the, uh, the, the new converts in the, in, in, in the church of Corinth, right? When you hear me talk about the love that God has for you, this is what I'm talking about. This is what you need to understand that love is. That's the first commandment. Love God with all of your strength. I'm sorry, with all of your thoughts, 
all of your emotions, with all of your strength, fully commit to loving God. And this is how he loves us as well. And he left us that second commandment here. Because love, in, in, in when, we, when we talk about it, because I also have to clarify this quite frequently in the sessions that I have with, with uh, my patients, right? They sometimes think that love is affection, right? When somebody is not showing affection, they don't love me. Or when they don't agree with me, how do you show me love? You're always right, my love, right? That's how, that's how we can show love, right? You're always right. But no, it's, disagreement doesn't mean a lack of love. So it's important to understand that acceptance of the other person with those flaws, right? It's very important. And those flaws, right, are the elements that become challenging to us in that second greatest commandment of all. God did an amazing thing for you and me, right? We can gravitate and love God back. And he tells us something very important. After we reconnect with God through his love, go ahead and take this love and show it to my neighbor. Family, that's, the, that's your first neighbor, right? Um, I am blessed to have a, uh, had a wonderful parents, have a wonderful wife, wonderful kids. None of them are perfect, right? But they're wonderful and they're easy to love. That's not always the case for everybody. I've had many patients who uh, are Adventists, Christians, so they understand this concept, right? And they, they read these passages, right? And they tell me that they struggle when they pray or when they read, right? my heavenly father. And that's because these individuals in their past experiences, they might be, have a struggle with physical, sexual, emotional abuse by their family members. So that concept, it, it, really, it really disrupts your neurological connections, right? And, but that's a topic for another day. It really impacts your understanding of love. And when you read these components, right, somebody caused me tremendous pain. Maybe you haven't had a severe situation as some of my patients, but maybe you have a family member that's very difficult to love because they've hurt you in the past. Never to say somebody in your neighborhood, somebody at work, somebody at school. But that is what God is asking us, that through his love, we need to love our neighbors, right? And uh, the servant of the mount, um, this is what he starts. This is uh, a part of this, this, this uh, sermon that he gives, right? Um, and we'll go through it here a little bit, uh, piece by piece. Um, in this part, right, uh, near, near after the Beatitudes, right, he comes and tells uh, the, the, those who are gathered and says, but I say to you who hear, and this to hear, it's the same one he used uh, in Deuteronomy. So it's like, pay attention. I'm going to give you instructions so that you take action and follow these instructions, right? He tells them, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who are abusive to you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic from him either. Okay. Has anybody gotten into an actual physical fight? Maybe not now, right? Maybe when you were younger, right? I, I will admit I got into plenty of fights. Don't tell, I've told my kids about it. You can tell them too, right? But when somebody hits you, Going to that first quiz, right? Is this the phase you're going to put when somebody hits you? No. Emotionally, right? You're going to feel scared or feel angry. That's the emotion that you're going to experience as a reflex, as part, perhaps, of our sinful nature, the, the things that we inherit that are not the original plan of God. 
So you are hit. Somebody steals for you, right? Your natural reaction is not to be happy or to feel love, right? But we just read in Corinthians, what is love? Love is not irritable. So when you feel one of these emotions, right, it's important just to accept that we are human beings and with our own capacity, we cannot avoid the reactions that we just shared, right? Well, maybe somebody here is perfect and somebody, no, I get hit and I just smile, right? I, I want to understand your secret, right? And it's not a secret because it's in the Bible. But we need to take action. We cannot just know about it. We can't just know about uh, Corinthians and the descriptions that Paul gave about love. We need to take action. There are things that irritate me. But when I think about the situation or the other person and give them the benefit of the doubt, think about their past experience and, and, and why they may be uh, responding or saying the things that they've said, all of a sudden, it starts to become easier to love them. And when we are connected to God, it is through that love that we change our experience. It's, that's how our irritation or our anger reduces. But it doesn't end there. And that's not the only situation. That's not the only emotion that we may go through, right? Here it continues and says, Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Now, let's put this into context, right? What was happening at that period uh, in history? The people of Israel were being subjugated by the Roman Empire. Put taxes, put uh, symbols in their temple, right? So the people of Israel were very angry at a lot of things that were happening in that moment, right? Then, then Jesus tells them, right? Look, these individuals are the ones that I want you to love because it is a lot easier to agree and love somebody that agrees with you, to love somebody that shows you affection, to love somebody that gives you compliment, to love that cop who stops you and doesn't give you a speeding ticket. May or may not have happened. We have mirror neurons. We have uh, these uh, couple of neurons uh, area uh, near our posterior cingulate cortex, kind of like in the middle part, not all the way to the back, but near the back. Um, they are uh, the first parts of the visual cortex um, because they help us, just like the quiz did, it helps us identify what the other person feels about us or the situation. And one of the reasons we call them mirror neurons is because it's much easier for us to respond in the same exact way. If somebody loves you, it is much easier to respond with that. But here, this is just telling you, look, even the sinners, right? Even the Gentiles, even the Romans, right? Even those who like the Seahawks can do this. I got to take advantage, pastor's not here. But even if you dislike and if you're, they're your enemies, you need to show love to them. What did Paul tell us before or actually after, right? Uh, in the historical context, right? Love is kind. Kindness is sometimes seen as a weakness in today's culture. Kindness is like, oh, well, I can just take advantage, right? But this is how you start changing somebody else. One of the first type of works that I had to do when I graduated uh, from college, right, I was a, a crisis counselor, which means I had to respond to a lot of uh, uh, situations that were quite risky. Situations where people have knives, guns, uh, significant threats, right? 
I had nothing against this, this particular individuals that I met, but they didn't know me. And just by showing up, I was their enemy. They didn't know what I was there. They've been going through a lot of things in their lives, right? They have perhaps weapons. And if not, they have their fists, right? They could always throw a swing at me. But when you use a specific tone, right? And tone matters. The words that we use matter, right? We might be telling some of our young people here biblical aspects, right? But the tone that we use matters, and it needs to include kindness. So in these situations where I may show, had to show up with individuals who were in a critical stage where I was seen as a threat, an important part of the training was to keep a level tone. Very firm with all the instructions, use kindness, but remain assertive. And all of a sudden, those same mirror neurons that I have, this other individual have, has, and when they see kindness, what starts to happen? They open up, they lower their knife, they put the gun away. Not through force, not through confrontation, through kindness. So this is why it's important to keep this element in the way we interact with others. We may be disagreeing. We might need to tell them to do something different than they, what they're doing. We have to approach it with kindness. All right. I may go a little faster here. Um, it continues and it says, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from who you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. Expectations. This is another issue that gets in the way of our interaction with others in a loving way. Sometimes the expectations that we have are not going to be fulfilled, right? Maybe it's that family member that is like, I just wish that they could show some affection and understanding. I wish that when I do this, they would behave the same way I'm behaving now. And yes, that makes everything easier. But when it doesn't happen, we can still show agape. We can still show love. What Jesus is describing there uh, today in my field, this is what we talk about, a transactional relationship. Transactional relationships are fine, right? Many of you are in business. Many of you need to have these type of interactions, have actual contracts. Uh, maybe not the same. Now you have a contract and you have to pay interest, right? But it's not a relationship that's founded in love because love is also patient. For all the reasons people come and, and work with me, there's still the big assumption that I am changing them. I cannot change anybody. It is the choices that the individual, the patient who meets with me, it's the choices that they make after our sessions that starts to create the change. And this is why then that love has to coincide with actions. And being patient is an action. Sometimes we see patience as like, well, I'm just waiting for. But that act of being patient is allowing you to let go of the expectations that you're going to change your significant other, your coworker, your child, anybody in your life. It is their journey and their process. They have the capacity to change, but they not may change today tomorrow, or next year. Love is being patient and respectful of the other person's journey. Let me keep going on. So we've got a couple of more here, and I want you not to dislove me or hate me because you're hungry. Hey, hunger does, does very funny things to uh, the way we feel, right? Um, it continues here. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, 
for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil people. Be merciful just as your father is merciful, right? And in Corinthians, we see that love is tame. It's not rude. And love does not demand its own way. Now, the word tame is, is something that I introduced there to help us see how we can respond to those disagreements. Help us see how we can respond in situations where we may be attacked, where we may be questioned, where we may be called liars, when keep filling in the blanks, right? When we encounter those situations, as we saw on those uh, uh, emotional re reflexes, love is not going to be our first instinct. It's not part of our reflex, but we can become aware of how we are responding and then choose to use love. Choose to use gentleness. Gentleness, again, oftentimes in today's culture, is seen as weak. We value power. We value strength. But there's tremendous strength in being gentle, in responding in a way that allows for collaboration, in a way that allows for consensus to be built instead of my way or the highway. Did I say that right? Those of you, uh, some, some of this, the English sayings are not, not my strength. And then I translate Spanish ones into English and they don't work. But this is, this, is, this is what Jesus is telling us, right? That we need to collaborate with others and we need to start that, not necessarily by being aggressive or showing power or showing strength. And yes, there are plenty of books, The Art of War, Machiavelli, right? Who propose different techniques on how to negotiate. But we have the truth in the Bible, and here it tells us how to respond. All right, keep it on. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Such abundance, right? That is promise. For by your standards of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Love is now proud or boastful. Humbleness. Humility. Again, these are not necessarily what we see in a lot of our modern culture. In the social media, in the movies, in the discourse, in the news, right? It's a lot about who has the most likes, who has the most followers by any means. But we are told to be humble. And psychologically speaking, that is challenging. And not necessarily because of personality thing, but because of the context. One of the ways that when I study to be baptized, when I learn more about the 28 fundamental beliefs or the Adventist church, is that we are the remnant church, the chosen people. When we see ourselves as chosen, which is not incorrect, just let me clarify, it is not incorrect, but perspective matters. When we don't see that we are chosen by somebody else's grace, and when we start to believe that it's our merit, it is who we are that makes us the chosen people, proudness starts to develop. And we saw the last emotion, um, of, uh, no, sorry, before seeing happiness, right? There was this gentleman showing contempt. I've shown contempt for the Seahawks, right? You see, see, it came out, it came out, that same facial expression just came out there for a second, right? But although there's not that um, significant risk when showing contempt in sports rivalries, when we show contempt for somebody who's not Adventist, somebody who's not vegetarian, somebody 
who's from a different race, somebody who chooses to parent their children different, somebody who chooses to drive a specific car, somebody that chooses specific music. We have to be mindful that a lot of times we start to judge. And that's because we hear frequently, this is the truth, this is the random, this is special, you are chosen. So it's very natural for every human being who starts seeing themselves as separate to show contempt. And yes, we are separate, we are chosen, we are the remnant, and we must act in a non-judgmental way to others. Because when we act in a non-judgmental way, it is much easier for the other person to see what? Where I started, God's love. It is sometime our behaviors, our actions, what we say that put this big, big barrier between God's love and what we are trying to communicate to others. We're getting there, going, going quickly here. Uh, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eyes. That part of Corinthians says that love rejoices when truth wins out. Sometimes because the past experiences that we've had, because we were told you did things wrong, I come from an era in countries that if you got the answer wrong, um, Tisa, how do you say that in English? The thing that you write in the checkboard? Um, that thing, you know what I'm talking about. Before this whiteboards, teachers had chalk. Yes, not chalk, chalk. I lived in a culture in a time where it was culturally appropriate that the teachers will throw that at you or use a ruler uh, and just smack you if you got the answer wrong, right? This was considered an effective way of teaching, by the way, and I see some of our teachers here don't get any ideas. Our self-esteem and how we see ourselves a lot of times in the, is dependent of us being right. And there's this emotional component that comes that we experience when we start to notice that we are wrong. Love allows us to be wrong, to feel secure with that individual, and to be confident and perhaps even rejoice and be happy because we found the answer. We found the truth. We found the solution. We found the correct way of moving forward, even though it was not our idea. This is what love can do. It can help in many situations, in family, in schools, at work. When the best idea wins, everybody wins. But sometimes this component of feeling proud or wanting to be right gets in the way. But through love, you can rejoice when the answer is, is found. Um, here, uh, the last uh, four verses of what I want to cover today here for, for the Sermon of the Mount, right? Jesus tells us, for there is no good tree that bears bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree that bears good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from the briar bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings for, forth what is good. And the evil person, out of evil treasure, brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills what? His heart. We can claim to have love. We can claim to have Jesus. We can claim to be Adventists. But what are the fruits of our actions? What are the fruits of our heart? It's got to be centered through the love of God and what we seek Paul tells us in Corinthians, right? If we have Christ, if we have love, we need to seek that and show patience, kindness, humility, gentleness. 
This is what the gospel tells us. That first commandment, fully commit to God with your thoughts and your emotions. And through that commitment, through loving God, then show the rest of the world who saved you, who's here for you. Because that's what God is, right? A big component that the enemy has twisted is that God is here to judge, to look at all the sins that you did, to see that you're unworthy of that love, which we are, but we have grace. John 3, 16, we all know it, but man, verse 17, for God who so loved the world that he gave his only one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. One of the biggest components, because we are imperfect, the enemy may make you feel unworthy of God's love. But he gives us to us, and we can accept it. We can take that, and then that second commandment becomes much easier. You can try. I've tried, right? But it's so much easier to love our neighbor, to love our enemies, once you are connected to God. And here... Um, reaching our conclusion of this sermon today. Uh, two more quotes. Uh, these are from uh, the Spirit of Prophecy. The law of God is a law of love. He surrounded us with beauty to teach us that we are not on earth only to look for ourselves, to dig and build, to work and spin, but to make life splendorous, joyous, beautiful. For the love of Christ, like flowers, we are to brighten other lives with the mystery of love. When we suffer, when we go through difficulties, it is much easier to be angry, to be sad. The pastor talked about in the, the earlier series uh, this year of the complaining, the, the, the natural ways of maybe responding. And it is a mystery how we may be experiencing physical, emotional pain and still be able to show love to others. And it's not because of what we can do. It's by starting with God's love. And when we can show love to others, I was mentioning, that is the best way to witness. That is change that is happening, not because of what we are capable, but we, because we have chosen to love God and his love is changing us. Love satisfies intimate needs. And here again, the enemy has done a great great job of deceiving, confusing people, right? A lot of times when we see the word intimate, uh, we think about uh, romantic, sexual components, right? But intimacy in the psychological, in the biblical perspective, taking it even further, right, is our ability to let our guard down. It's our ability to be vulnerable with each other. Because we don't fear being judged. We don't fear being, uh, you know, lashed upon. We don't fear being uh, told that we're wrong. We don't fear, fear being rejected. When we don't fear those other elements. Because we are in a relationship. We're in a church. We're in a community, in a school that loves you. You can be intimate. You can be vulnerable. And here's what the quote says. Love should be the driving principle to what? To action. That is one of the main components that I hope that you're able to take. It includes and requires action. Not just knowing it, not just feeling it, but the behavior, the choice, the action. Love is the fundamental principle of God's government in heaven and on earth. And it should be the foundation of the Christian character. Only this is capable to enable you to withstand the trial, and the temptation. There are many things we're going to go through. Sometimes we just struggle with the current commandments. With your, you know, some of you have kids, right? You have chores and rules, and they struggle to follow. Them. That's just how the enemy has deceived us into thinking that any sort of rules is there just to make life difficult. But we, we, when we understand that God is love, and that he wants the best of us. He gives us free choice of what to do, right? He doesn't force us. It's so like, here are the things that I want you to follow. I guess it's good not to steal, right? It's not to commit murder. All of those things are important. And when we follow his law, which is love, we benefit, our community benefits, 
and we can continue to share his love. Coming to the end, and if you can uh, queue up one last video here to show, I want you guys to reflect a little bit in some of your past experiences. This Bible verses may not be new. You might have heard sermons about this uh, in the past. And it's not necessarily a lack of knowledge at times, but it's those things that have hurt us in the past and the reflex that we have in protecting us, in putting barriers by running away, by becoming aggressive, by doing a lot of times the opposite of what we just read over here with regards to Corinthians. And as you reflect that in those moments where you might have experienced some pain, some agony, to overcome them, not because of what you think, what you have learned, but just put it in prayer and ask God to help you through his love, love that person back. Not condoning, not agreeing, not liking what happened, but showing love. So for any situation that you may have encountered, there's probably something here in Corinthians that applies to you. So as we listen and watch the video, think about something in your past and ask God through his love, the ability to love that person back. Got it? I think you close it. It's in the desktop. That's okay. That's okay. Um, let's bow our heads. And maybe you can stay a little bit um, after I pray. Uh, if you want to fellowship in here, we might be able to still show you that video. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we reflect back on moments that... Uh, were not designed in your original plan for us, but the enemy has infiltrated this world and he's trying to cause pain, like that lion, because he knows you're coming soon and he wants to get in the way of our ability to share that gospel, which is your amazing grace and how through that love and grace that you've given us that we can change and we can love other people. We can love those who may have hurt us, we can love those who we disagree with, not with our merits, but what you have done. Through the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.